This week I'd like to take a look at the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. This is just a New Testament it's with the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition. Here is the ISBN. This book is, uh, as I said, it's large. It's ten and a quarter inches tall, seven and five sixteenths inches wide, and one and three quarters inches thick at the spine to give you a sense for what that means. Here is another Ignatius Press Bible. This is the complete Old Testament and New Testament, and it's a smaller volume, not as wide, not as tall, not as thick. Here's the Didache Bible which is again not as tall, not as wide. Didache Bible is a bit thicker. Here's another New Testament. This is the uh, revised New Jerusalem Bible New Testament. Much shorter volume, a bit thicker, but not as wide. And here is the uh, New Rome Press Portable Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament. So that is really quite an amazing contrast, isn't it? And this is still larger than most vest, po vest pocket New Testaments that you can get. We'll open it up and we'll take a look at the inside layout. So you have two columns of text. Each column is 72 millimeters wide and I count about 52 characters per line. The pages or as you would expect, quite large, 254 millimeters tall, or 10 inches tall, 177 millimeters wide, that's 6.96 inches wide. The text is often line matched, but it isn't always. So if we look over here to page 229, so the um, offset from the line matching isn't very bad, but if you look there where I have it illuminated, you can see that the print on the opposite page is just a little bit lower than the print on this page. It's not very bad again because the paper is quite thick. The print is somewhat slender and it is light in places. The uh, margins at the top I measure to be 11 to 12 millimeters, so from the edge to the top of a line of text, say the top of a capital. At the bottom it's uh, 10 to 11 millimeters. The inner margin is narrow, but it can be as much as 11 millimeters. The outer margin is 15 to 17 millimeters. I measure the font in the text when I compare it to Times New Roman to be about 10 and a half points tall. That's for both the capitals and the lowercase. It's advertised as 10 points. The line height is 3.89 millimeters, which equates to 11 points. The verse numbers are in black, and they are generally inside the paragraph. They are raised at the beginning of the paragraph. They are not. Uh, in the Revised Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition and Second Catholic Edition, words that the translators add for smoothing are not in italic text, so you will not find that. You will not find pronouns for deity capitalized. They will be lowercase, uh, lowercase, and that's the way I prefer them myself. Below the text, you'll find a section offset for references. It is in about an eight point font, and it is tagged back to the verse number. So if I wanted to read this backwards from this reference to Psalm 2.2. My question is, where is Psalm 2.2 referenced on this page? I don't have to search around, it's right there in 427, so it's up here. Um, there are page bottom, bottom notes, they are in two columns, the font here is smaller than the text, it's about a 7.5 point font, the column width is the same as in the text of the Bible, 72 millimeters, and I count about 64 characters per line here. This paper is very good. I measure the sheet thickness to be 101 micrometers, which gives me an estimated paper weight of 93 GSM. I don't know how accurate that is. I think my estimates are accurate down in the 20, 30, 40 GSM area, but I'm not sure at all about how they are at such thicknesses. Uh, the surface is very nearly matte. You may see a diffuse glare there, but there is no sheen. 
which is the way you want it. You don't need to be worrying about a sheen, a reflection of the lamp light back into your eyes. Color is light yellow, and there is very little show through. So if we look closely, we see an indication that there's print on the other page, but it really doesn't annoy us. There's some print and uniformity that's uh, noticeable and common. Let me show you pages 164 and 165. So, um, here, 164 on the left, it's just a bit darker than 165 on the right. That's the kind of variation I found. Certainly this is usable on the right. Uh, this is a little better on the left. There are introductions to the books. We're looking now at the introduction to Luke's Gospel. And you can see it's formatted in the same two-column approach, 72 millimeter wide. Uh, font is the same as in the Bible itself, 10.5 point font. We have sections for the author, date, destination, structure, themes. That's the end of the themes section. And then we come to an outline. And the following page, you see the uh, gospel begin itself. Their book titles, and generally they are placed on a page other than the title page. They are at the outside top of the page, which is a good place for them. The contents are there as well. It doesn't give you the range of verses that are on the page, but it does tell you you're in Luke chapter 1 here. Page numbers are in the center bottom. And generally speaking, uh, unless you're just not very familiar with the Bible at all, you don't use the page numbers. Uh, there are headings in the text. They are in a bold nine-point font, a sans-serif font. Chapter numbers are large and bold. Let's find one. Got to get to the end of chapter one. Well, here's chapter three. So you can see that that spans uh, two lines of text, and it's a large, bold, black numeral. Uh, the books of the Bible do begin on a separate page, as far as I've been able to tell. If we look at some of the smaller books in the back, 1 John, so here's 2 John. 2 John has its own one-page introduction, and then it begins on the separate page. 3 John has an introduction, and uh, it begins on a separate page. And here you can see the uh, amount of show-through you have. That's really not very bad at all, is it? It's very thick, opaque paper. The words of Christ are in black ink, and I certainly prefer that myself. Here we go. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been lying there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? All in black ink. Quotations from the Old Testament in the New are in what we Americans refer to as quotation marks, these double comma-like objects surrounding the text. Sometimes they're offset, like here. Sometimes they're within the paragraph, as here. At the end of the New Testament, so this is the end of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, there's a concise concordance. It calls itself concise, but it's 168 pages long in two columns. The entries, the capitals, are about a 6.5 point font. The context lines here are close to 8 points in size. The uh, concordance is limited to the New Testament, so it's really quite thorough for a concordance that refers only to the New Testament. At the end of the concordance, uh, we come to a series of indices. So here's the first one, um, index of parables and metaphors of Jesus. That's followed by the index of the miracles of Jesus. So I'm sure these could be quite useful. That goes for two pages. There's an index of doctrines, and I think this may be the most useful part. So if you want to find uh, where the text or notes refer to a particular doctrine, 
can refer to this. I'll map you back to the location in the New Testament where you'll find that topic discussed. Here's one that just caught my eye as we passed on infant baptism. That's the index of doctrines. We have an index of charts, an index of maps. So those are the in-text maps. Those are not the color maps that we're about to see. Index of topical essays. We'll take a look at a topical essay or two as we proceed. And then an index of word studies. So studies on those different uh, theological concepts and just topics in general, like elders. The word hallelujah are mentioned. Here we have abbreviations used uh, for the various books of the Bible. And then we come to the color maps. These are low to detail. They are on a semi-gloss paper, so it's not really very waxy, but there is a bit of a sheen to it. And uh, as I said, they're quite low detail. How many maps? There's seven co color maps. They span eight pages. Some of them do go into the gutter, and if you look in the gutter, you can see the stitching lines. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six lines of thread visible in this map of the Roman Empire. That's the map that goes into the gutter. The end, end map here is kind of glued to this end sheet. We have uh, a very dark slate gray uh, paste down liner. It's paper. It's definitely a sewn hardback as we've seen. There are uh, no ribbon markers. There are red and black head and tail bands. Keeping the camera in focus here with my hand. Now the cover as we mentioned is decorated with these symbols from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there's uh, an icon of Christ holding the New Testament open to John 8:12. The book lies open in both Matthew and Revelation. So here we are. And you have to kind of bend the text a little bit to get it to lie open, but it does. Same happens in Revelation. The text does fall off into the gutter because this inner margin is so narrow. So. You see here it's dropping off rather precipitously, so you're going to have to adjust the book to keep the portion of it that you want to read flat. That's not a major trouble. We go to the front, we see the same dark slate gray to black paste down construction. The half title page, then a full title page telling you that this is the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition, New Testament. And uh, it was revised in 2001 with notes by Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch and maps by David Not Notley, Ignatius Press, San Francisco. I know a lot of people are interested if it has uh, been authorized, so the original Revised Standard Version 1966 text has uh, been authorized and then commentaries, introduction and notes as well in 2010. Cover art is by Christopher Pelicano designed by Roxanne Mylum and here are ISBNs the paperback, the hardback, and I'm not sure what LB stands for. Leather? Leather bound? The contents, we've just seen that, and then um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The interesting thing is here that there is a, an introduction to the Gospels and introductions to each of the books, but there is no, say, section introduction to the Epistles of Paul or the Catholic Epistles which is a bit odd. And then the things we've seen at the back, the concise concordance and the various indices and the abbreviations for the names of the book of the Bible, books of the Bible, introduction to the 1966 edition. 
an introduction to the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. We may come back and look at portions of this later. It seems like uh, a lot of useful information. We may yeah, take note of a few portions of it. Then the introduction to the Gospels I mentioned earlier by Curtis Mitch. kind of hard to get a grip on a page sometimes, but because the paper is so thick, you don't have to worry about uh, very floppy pages, perhaps getting bent and folded as you turn, which is certainly an, an advantage to having a big, heavy paper volume like this. Then we come to the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now we will take a look at the font close up, and I like the line spacing. I think it's quite good. Look at the gap here between the descender and the Y and the quotation marks. So you have a lot of uh, space here. I may have forgotten to mention that the uh, paper color is light uh, yellow. I think we'll see that when we do some font comparisons in a moment. Tracking is a bit tight, um, but not overly so. See how close the S and the A are there, but they don't actually run into each other. So I think that's quite good. The font itself is kind of reminiscent of Times New Roman, but perhaps with the lowercase letters just a bit larger and perhaps rounder. Nothing uh, unusual in the style of uh, the design of any of the characters. Now I have on the right the uh, Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition Complete Bible. And I believe the two fonts are the same, it's just that the one on the left is uh, a bit larger than the one on the right. And notice also that the paper on the right is uh, more yellow than that on the left, but otherwise they're quite similar. Now on the right I have the Didache Bible, and this allows you to see that the paper on the Bible on the left really is a bit on the yellow side. It's a bit of a cream colored paper. The font in the Didache Bible is uh, somewhat bolder, and I do like a bold font myself. Line spacing on the right is, like that on the left, quite generous. I think the descenders on characters and the font on the right are a bit longer than those on the left, so you do have characters approaching each other, like there's a Y and 13 years old on the right that seems to almost touch flesh and the line below it. Now on the right is the font in the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, New Testament. Again, this shows you that the paper on the left does have a yellow hue to it. The uh, font on the right is much smaller than that on the left. It actually appears to my eyes to be even less bold than the font on the left. The uh, full Revised New Jerusalem Bible is, of course, a larger font. Something much more comparable to that on the left. And now on the right is the Eastern Orthodox Bible Portable New Testament. And it's quite attractive, but uh, quite a lot smaller than the font on the left. And uh, finally, I've brought in on the right the uh, St. Joseph medium-sized N-A-B-R-E. And it has a good bold font with nice line spacing. Uh, rather tight tracking, but it uh, doesn't disturb me very much. And again, you can see how yellow the paper on the left is by comparison. So the way I'd like to proceed next is to take a look at the references and then the footnotes, and then uh, circle back and look at perhaps the introduction to the volume by Scott Hahn, and um, perhaps a, uh, a book introduction if we have time. So starting with the references, you'll notice that on this page there are no references. On the opposite page, there are a few in that center section, but here there aren't any, which kind of surprised me. I did skim through looking for references to um, the deuterocanonical books, and I didn't find them, at least I don't remember seeing any, in the uh, reference section that's normally here. Here's an example of where I would have expected to see one. This is First Timothy 1.17 where you see this expression, the King of Ages. You do have a footnote, but if we pan down, 
you'll see that it says uh, to the king of ages and says it's possibly a Jewish doxology passed into the liturgy of the church. Um, others like it punctuate the letters of Paul. But if you look in your Nestle Elan 28th edition, you'll see here First Timothy 1.17, uh, but to the king of ages. And then there's a reference over here in the margin to Tobit 13, 7, 11. So here's, here's the word for king, and that's of ages, possessive, plural. If we look in um, the Greek Old Testament, this is Rolf Septuagint, we see in 13, 7 here, we see the king of ages, and down in 11, you see it as well, the king of ages. So I would have anticipated either a uh, footnote, a reference to that, or a reference here in the reference section, connecting us back to Tobit chapter 13, but there isn't one. So that was a bit puzzling. When we look at uh, 1 Timothy 6.15, things are a bit different going to focus on these expressions titled King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You notice here at least there is one reference, but it's not to our verse 615, it's to 613. If we look below, there is a note, and at this zoom I can't quite capture it all in one screen, but it does mention these titles, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and it makes reference to uh, the Psalms and Daniel, where you find similar expressions, but not quite the same as King of Kings. You do find Lord of Lords in the passage in the Psalms. And then Second Maccabees 13.4. And um, to my knowledge, that's the only place where you do see King of Kings. So if you look there at uh, Second Maccabees 13.4, top of the page here, you see King of Kings. It's not quite the same expression grammatically in the Greek New Testament, but it's very similar. Finally, notice uh, Revelation 8.2, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God. Um, if you look in the margin of the Nestle Elan 28th edition again, you see that they refer you to Tobit. 1215. You see nothing down here though in the references to Tobit. Happily, again, you have a footnote. And so this footnote refers to seven angels and mentions Tobit 1215. And if we look at Tobit 1215, we see that there is a direct connection here. Raphael says, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels who present the prayers of the saints and enter into the presence of the glory of the Lord. So I think the moral is that uh, although in the references themselves, in this block on the page, you'll in general not find references to the Deuterocanonical books. If you take a look down at the notes at the bottom of the page, you will see where the New Testament is alluding to and possibly quoting those books. Now, due to the limits of time, we won't be able to examine very many footnotes, but I'd like to uh, look at a few of them, and we'll start here by examining the note at Matthew 20:28. 20, um, I was curious to see what they say about this expression, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, which I think a number of scholars think was interpolated into the Gospels because uh, of Paul's theology. But if we look on this page, we don't find any note at all. So um, I moved on to the parallel passage. So here we are in Mark uh, 10.45, the Son of Man came give his life as a ransom for many. So does the footnote, uh, or do the footnotes below cast doubt on the reliability of the text, or do they indicate that this is a foreign concept to Mark's gospel? Well, I'm happy to say no. Um, what they do is uh, 
connect it um, to uh, the notion of universal atonement, uh, not just for some, but for the sins of the entire world, which is, um, I think, uh, clearly debatable, but at least it's making the point that he is dying for the sins of people, which is good. So there's a substitutionary atonement concept coming across. And then they connect it to um, Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant. And then there's a word study. I don't think we've looked at a word study before. But here's one on the word ransom. And I will just leave it there for a moment so that you can pause it and read it. Hopefully it's in focus. If you were interested in finding similar passages, you might go back to the Index of Doctrines and look up Ransom. There you would see that there are no more verses that explicitly talk about Ransom listed, but it does point you towards atonement, redemption, and salvation. So under atonement, we have several passages mentioned. Romans, 2 Corinthians, Hebrews, 1 Peter, 1 John. And then it points us again to reconciliation, redemption, and sacrifice. So we could go and look at sacrifice next, if we liked. So in the Index of Doctrines, under sacrifice, you see a reference to Romans 12.1, where Christians are to present themselves as living sacrifice, then to the Eucharist as a sacrifice. At the top of the next column, you see an entry from Hebrews 9.22 about expiation. And Jesus' death was a sacrifice for sins, which I think is what we're most interested in here. And it gives you multiple passages. And then at the end, uh, more references. We could look at atonement, which is where we came from. Eucharist, reconciliation, redemption, and salvation, which was uh, mentioned in the earlier one along with redemption. Well, I, I took us there because I just wanted to point out that the index is not comprehensive. Uh, we found ourselves under sacrifice, and I would have thought I would have found a reference to this verse. This is Galatians 1, 4 there. Um, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. And the annotation below agrees with me that this is a reference to sacrifice. We look down here, we see under 1, 4, gave himself for our sins. And it anticipates the description of Christ's act of redemption in 3.13-14. through 14. Paul emphasizes that Jesus willingly offered himself as a sacrifice for our salvation. So I, my point is that the index is helpful, but it's uh, not comprehensive by any means. Switching gears a bit, but uh, keeping on the topic of the notes and staying in Galatians. We're now in Galatians 5, 6, where the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. And the note below reminds you that you are looking at a Catholic Bible. Because if we read the note at 5, 6, on faith working through love, it says faith alone is insufficient to justify the sinner. If it stands by itself and fails to join with love in acts of generosity and service, it is empty and vain. I pointed out earlier that the footnotes are a very good place to find references to the deuterocanonical books. Um, they do something else well, and I wanted to point that out by looking here at... Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? If you go down to the footnote below, it points out that um, this quotation is from the Greek version of Psalm 8, 4 through 6, that is the Septuagint, and it explains how this differs from most modern translations. I was curious as to what uh, interpretation the study Bible makes of Matthew 24, 1 through 25, the 46, the Olivet Discourse. And uh, their perspective is that it really prophetically is about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. But then they add that typologically the devastation of the temple 
anticipates the fiery dissolution of heaven and earth. So in one sense it does have to do with the end of time in their view. As you might anticipate, that there is a footnote at Revelation 20 that discusses the concepts of the thousand years. So we will pan down and let you read it. Discusses Kiliasm, postmillennialism, second, and then at the bottom of the screen there, amillennialism. If you follow this down to the bottom, it begins a sentence that continues on the next column. The Catholic Church rejects all forms of millenarianism, that is, kiliasm, or premillennialism which contends that Christ will come again to establish a visible kingdom on the earth and to inaugurate a golden age of peace and prosperity within human history. In Romans 5, on verse 12, which talks about Adam and Christ, you find a very clear statement of the doctrine of original sin down in the footnote below, which says that uh, the Council of Trent appealed to Romans 5.12 when it defined the doctrine of original sin in 1546, session 5. The doctrine holds that all descendants of Adam are born into the world in a state of spiritual death and in desperate need of salvation. The condition spreads not by imitation, but by propagation. It is also not surprising to find the clear statements about baptism here, uh, this is Acts 2.38 and 2.39. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and to your children. If you look below in the footnotes, on 2.38, it says that the Council of Trent in 1547 describes baptism as the instrumental cause of our justification, that is, the means used by Christ to cleanse us of guilt, fill us with the grace of divine life, and adopt us as children of God. And then, related to and to your children, in the following verse, it says, the benefits of baptism are available to adults and children alike. This explains why the apostles baptized entire households. There's an interesting note here in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, the one on verse 17 is the one I'm most interested in. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. It will be difficult for me to show this because the notes span two pages. Notes down below first talk about the cup of blessing, which is mentioned in verse 16. The traditional name for the third cup, which is what Jesus blessed and consecrated at the Passover of the Last Supper. Then on the word participation, we all partake of the one bread. Eucharistic communion unites believers with Christ and with one another. And this continues the note. These two blessings are related in as much as the sacrament of Christ's body and blood is what continues to mold us into the ecclesial body of Christ, the Church. When I was doing the overview of the layout earlier, I think I've neglected to mention that at the bottom of the pages you will find the Revised Standard Version's uh, text and translation notes. They're in about a six and a half point font. That's uh, unlike the Didache Bible, which if I rem recall correctly, omits them. So I've taken us to James chapter 5. Again, this is a bit of a challenge because our text spans two pages. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And over there. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayers of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. If we look at the uh, footnote, again we find a reference to the Council of Trent, this time 1551, which interpreted this text as a reference to the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, uh, which used to be called the last unction, I believe, which is administered by priests to the aged and seriously ill. 
is a final example of the notes. We're in Titus now. This is chapter 1. And um, verses 5 and 6. Uh, I left you in Crete that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or being insubordinate. If we go look at the notes here, this one's very interesting. Appoint elders. Uh, an essential step in organizing and stabilizing young Christian communities that Titus is charged with this duty indicates that he is already a bishop and thus qualified to ordain others to priestly ministry by the sacramental imposition, imposition of hands. Um, elders and bishops seem to have been used interchangeably at this time. That's correct. Um, down below a bit, husband of one wife, what do they say about that? That is, married only once during his lifetime. Paul allows younger widows to remarry. However, he holds prospective clergymen to a more stringent standard. Hopefully I've given you enough examples of the annotations to give you a good sense for the flavor and character of them. We're now looking at the introduction by Dr. Hahn, and I just wanted to point out one thing here under this paragraph, Inspiration and Inerrancy. This paragraph essentially affirms the principle of biblical inerrancy. God cannot lie. The Bible is divinely inspired, so it must be without error, and everything that its divine and human authors affirm to be true. And then he says later on, The mantle of inerrancy likewise covers faith and morals, but it extends even farther to ensure that all the facts and events of salvation here history are accurately presented for us in the scriptures first essay we'll look at is this one, is Matthew's infancy narrative historical? And they point out here that um, some say that uh, Matthew doesn't really give you the account of Jesus' birth, but instead he composed what's called a midrash, uh, an interpretation or commentary on the events. If we look down at the uh, summary, I'll let you pause. I think you'll be able to read this if you like. By pausing, so we'll go slowly enough to allow you to do that. Let's get down to the summary paragraph here. In summary, the infancy narrative is theological and historical. Uh, he intends readers to view Jesus' early life as real events with real characters. Jesus himself holds the key to the Old Testament. His coming marks a new era in salvation history that gathers up God's promises and brings them to fulfillment. The historical reliability of Matthew 1-2 to 2 then is consistent with Catholic traditions and sound principles of biblical and historical study. I think it's well known that there's an apparent discrepancy between John's Gospel and the Synoptic Gospel on when the Passover meal was held. We'll take a look briefly at this uh, essay, but first I wanted to just show uh, in comparison what some other study Bible notes say about that issue. So this is the New American Bible Revised Edition, the old New American Bible New Testament, of course. John chapter 13, before the Feast of the Passover, and if you look at the note before the Feast of the Passover in the right column, it simply says that this would be Thursday evening before the day of preparation. In the synoptics, the Last Supper is a Passover meal taking place. That is, the Passover meal took place on Thursday night. In John's chronology, on Friday evening, so Christ is sacrificed in John's chronology at the same time that the lambs are being sacrificed for the Passover meal on Friday night. And, uh, now, it may be that somewhere in these notes they attempt to reconcile it, but I don't see any attempt, I haven't found an attempt to reconcile the synoptics with John's Gospel in the NAB. The uh, Revised New Jerusalem Bible in Mark 14 has a note, this is page 1929 if you have a copy, and it says, according to John 18.28, Jesus' death fell on the day before Passover, 
the eve of the Passover supper. If this is correct, either the Last Supper was not a Passover meal or Jesus was following a different calendar, and the skeletal accounts of the two instants of the supper do not settle the matter. There is also a note on the in the Didache Bible on this topic. Now there may be other notes elsewhere, but this is the one I found. This is on John 19:14. And it says, uh, John was identifying Christ with the sacrificial lamb in the Passover. This detail of time seems to indicate that Christ and his apostles celebrated the Passover at the Last Supper two days earlier than indicated on the column, common calendar. Some theorize that he celebrated the Passover following the calendar used by a Jewish sect called the Essenes. There's also an interesting note in the Orthodox Study Bible. On John 19:14, while the Synoptic Gospels date the crucifixion on the first day of Passover, John dates it on the preparation day, the day before Passover. Thus, in the Synoptic tradition, the Last Supper is the Passover meal, while in John's Gospel, Jesus, as the Lamb of God, dies at the exact time the Passover lambs are being slain in the temple. Then, while it is impossible to determine which is historically accurate, both traditions are theologically accurate. The mystical supper is the fulfillment of the Passover meal, and Christ's death is the fulfillment of the Passover lambs being slain. It's interesting, though, that they suggest that only one of them is historically accurate. The other one would then be inaccurate. So, uh, by comparison, this is the full page that you get on this topic in the topical essay entitled when did Jesus celebrate the Last Supper here in your Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament? And this really is a wealth of material. I'm of course, of course, I'm not going to read through this and discuss it. I just want to give you a sense for the character and quality of these notes. So, panning down slowly so that you can pause it and read it if you like should help you decide whether this is a volume that you think you should add to your library. One more pan down. Alright, so there we go. I realize I hadn't shown you any of the grayscale maps, so here's one of them. This is in Acts chapter 2, showing the nations represented in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Grayscale, uh, not highly detailed, but it does contain useful information. We are almost ready for the summary. I just wanted to say a few words, as I normally do in a review, about the translation itself. So my translation continuum chart should be coming up. I haven't scored the Revised Standard Version Catholic or Second Catholic Edition separately, but it really isn't radically different from the Revised Standard Version New Testament of 1971. This is my continuum chart based on 200 New Testament verses chosen at random. And what I do here is count what I call liberties. It's much more difficult to count liberties in a very loose translation like the Jerusalem Bible than it is in a very literal one like the American Standard Version. But I did what I could and came up with this graphic which shows that the Revised Standard Version is toward the more literal end of the scale in terms of New Testament translations. The next two charts will talk about the New Testament textual basis. The first one here shows the Nestle Elan 28th edition on the y-axis and Robinson Pierpont's Byzantine text form on the x-axis. And you see a red box there around RSV 2CE. So um, the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic edition agrees with the most recent uh, critical Greek New Testament, the Nestle Elan 28th edition around 48% of the time, but it is far from a majority text uh, text basis as, say, the uh, Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament or the King James Version are. Um, next uh, chart shows um, the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition um, as mapped against the Nestle Elan 28th edition in the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which is a recent evangelical 
New Testament. And so again, uh, agreement with the Nestle Elan 28th edition is not very high. Uh, the New American Bible agrees with Nestle Elan 28th edition very closely. I think it's based on the 26th edition of Nestle Elan 28th edition, but the 26th edition and the 28th edition are not radically different. Uh, the Revised Standard Version is much older and uh, would, of course, not be following the most recent Greek New Testaments. It does, though, tend to agree with the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, a recent evangelical Greek New Testament, fairly often, in fact, uh, it has the third highest frequency of agreement with Tyndall House of the translations I've looked at. Now, the book we're reviewing today doesn't include the Old Testament, but the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition did and I did score it for this chart. This shows the rate of departures from the Masoretic text. I essentially looked at 100 verses where I know that there are variant readings, uh, readings that are different from those in the Masoretic Hebrew. To the far right there, you see the New English translation of the Septuagint, and you would expect the Septuagint to have a high rate of departure from the Masoretic. And the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition, is... Uh, relatively close to the Masoretic text, but it does deviate from it from time to time. I think the total number of deviations out of 100 that I found is 28. It uh, is the same number of deviations as in the New International Version of 2011. So what do we say for a summary? Um, it is a large volume, and it's just the New Testament. And the first question that comes to my mind is, when they finally get this thing finished, what are they going to do? Is it going to be like four volumes this size? Regarding this volume, um, I think if you're a traditional Catholic who uh, believes that the Pope is really the Pope, and that Vatican, uh, that, uh, Vatican II was a real council, uh, that this might be the kind of study Bible for you just as the Didache Bible is. It appears to be a conservative Catholic uh, New Testament. Um, the notes, as you saw, uh, seem to be orthodox, lower, lower case O orthodox, from a Catholic perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, build and quality, um, it's a sewn hardback, so it's going to last. Uh, the print quality seems to be very good. We did notice some variations in darkness here and there, but they're not major. I think page on the right is just a hair, just slightly darker than the page on the left, but nothing really significant there. Uh, the font is uh, nice and readable, uh, as well in the notes. The, font there is not too small as to cause a great deal of eye strain. The content seems to be very detailed and informative and well researched. So um, all that said, I, I think that this uh, would probably be an excellent, excellent addition to your library. So with that we'll conclude. I want to thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, if you do like the video, uh, remember to hit the uh, thumbs up button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel and are inclined to do so, please do. Thank you for your time.